Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to the Roundup Podcast. I am your host, Mitch Tidwell. Thank you for joining us today. We are super excited to have, this is our Ask Yoda session, and so for this session, we have invited on Brian Fry, who is the former National Collegiate Strategist for the North American Mission Board, who's been a good friend to many of you and certainly many churches and college ministries across North America. He is a a friend and a mentor of mine who I greatly appreciate. And about a year and a half ago, he decided to to jump out of denominational life and ministry and to jump into a local church and serve faithfully there at Resonate Church in in Pullman, Washington, but also get a normal, regular job, a nine-to-five job working for a company where he helps onboard and do leader development in that company. And so we we're asking we're, this is an Ask Yoda session and normally what we do is we pull questions off of Facebook, but since we haven't heard from Brian in a while, I just want to do like a quick update on him, where he's at, uh, what he's learning doing college ministry and working full-time in the marketplace, and then just really kind of his general thoughts on where college ministry is heading and what he's kind of learned from being kind of out of the thick of, you know, this broad ministry over all of North America to just being centrally located in one place. And so it's a really great listen. Stick around. Brian has some really helpful things to say, I think, for if you're a college leader, to help you relate to the person in your ministry that has a lot on their plate, that has a lot on their schedule, and then also how to how to help develop the team that you're currently leading. I think he's got some really valuable things to say in there as well. So uh, super excited to have Brian on. But before we get there, I do want to talk a little bit about Texas Roundup, or actually we're transitioning this year, it's just called Roundup. It's an event we have May 12th through the 14th. We're going to have it in Dallas-Fort Worth here in Texas. And what it is, is it's a collaborative learning environment that champions church-based collegiate multipliers. So what we're seeking to do is create a community of, of folks in churches who are doing college ministries, develop this community, and really foster this environment of community and learning and really just setting a vision for disciple making and multiplication. It's a great three days. We have an awesome lineup. We've got J.D. Greer coming, who's the current SBC president and lead pastor of the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham. They reach a ton of college students there. We have Daniel Yang, who is the director of the Send Institute. And uh, what Daniel's going to help us do is think about the church in the future. What do we need to know as, as ministers college ministers, as we're walking into the future, and especially a crazy future in light of COVID and all the social issues that we've been faced with over the past year. And then we have Dusty Thompson, who is the lead pastor of Redeemer Church in Lubbock, who is a just a great guy and has invested in college students for a long time as a lead pastor. And so we'll hear from him as well. But we have a, a ton of different breakouts. We have two tracks. We have a pastor, college minister track that's for kind of the adults, uh, that are helping lead your ministry. And then we have a student leader track for your student leaders that come. We have a track just for them too. So come, do not come alone. If you if you have to, go ahead, but try not to come alone. Bring some people with you because there's going to be times for you to learn. There's going to be times for you to network, time for you to collaborate with other churches. And then we'll even help you by the end of the event. We're going to actually help you put together a plan to that way, when well, before you leave, you actually have a plan of action, and you don't kind of have to wait two weeks and then think, okay, what do we learn? Okay, what do we need to do? Like that kind of thing. So we'll have all of that mapped out for you. So Roundup, it's going to be May 12th through the 14th, and the registration is completely free, so all you have to do is get there. So you can register at sbtexas.com forward slash Roundup. Again, sbtexas.com forward slash Roundup. Follow us on social media at SBTC Collegiate. You can find some more information there. So don't miss that. All right, friends. Well, let's get to it well, with my conversation with Brian Fry. You're listening to the Roundup Podcast, a podcast on reaching the college campus, developing leaders, and sending out kingdom multipliers. This podcast is created by the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention and provided through cooperative program giving. Well, hey, Brian, how you doing, man? Doing well, Mitch. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's uh, good to see you. I know it's been a minute since we've gotten to chat, so it's uh, yeah, really it a lot of fun. Yeah. And just want to let you know that the legend of Brian Fry just continues across the nation, and so I know, <laughs> I know you'll be really excited. Uh, Whether that is famous or infamous, that is, <laughs> is yet to be determined. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we'll see. Hey, a year later, it's looking pretty good. We'll see what happens a few years down the road. But we will. No, nah, man, we're uh, super excited to have you on. And, And really, I know that um, just kind of a brief history for the folks that are listening. So my very first day on the job as collegiate associate for the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention 
I was in a tear sheet session with Brian Fry. I think we were at Southwestern Seminary. And so I don't know if you knew that, but that was my first day on the job. That's pretty crazy. And yeah. so we got to know each other. I think we we had actually met previously through Lance Kroll, who was here, which by the way, I told him we were meeting today. He said, tell you hello. So Lance, please pass a greeting on to him as well. It's a good man there. I will. He is a great dude. But yeah, so we met there and man, he just became a, a great friend and a, and a mentor and really helped change the way I thought about resourcing churches, adding value to churches and calling churches to something more than, I don't know, that probably don't have a nice way to put it, but just calling leader, the churches descending to see their churches, not just a place where we're just gathering in circles, but we're sending people and making disciples and multiplication. So just want to thank you for that and the influence you've had on me and so many other churches around the nation. But I know probably, I guess, has it been a year and a half, year and a half ago, you left NAM, right? We did, yeah. Left a role at NAM and the State Convention of Baptist in Ohio. Transitioned oh, yeah. out to Washington. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So for you that don't know, Brian was the National Collegiate Strategist at the North American Mission Board for how long was that? Man, so it was probably seven, six years. Six, six years, years in that slot. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. Had served, know. Had served in State Convention, uh, State Convention of Baptist Ohio staff. Yeah. Yeah, for a few years before that. So ended up being an, an integrated role. So we get to direct stuff in Ohio and then work on the national level as well. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Well, one of the things Brian was kind of did is Brian helped kind of create these communities of churches and leaders all across the nation to help plant churches in college town to reach students and to plant more churches. And uh, it's kind of the legacy that he's lived behind. But now You've kind of transitioned a bit. You're part of Resonate Church, which was a big part of your work with NAM, but you're also working a nine to five, or I don't know if it's a, I don't know if you consider it that, but you're doing both. Yeah, working full time in corporate worlds, work at a local company here in Pullman, Washington, mm-hmm. and uh, do leader development and then lead the onboarding team for our company as well. Awesome. So leader development onboarding. So you're just new employees and then just helping just other departments, just kind of yeah, so, their expertise. So for those who've hung around uh, the SIN network stuff or who've worked in state convention life, it's likely that you've talked about or heard about leadership pipelines. Mm-hmm. So in our world, basically working on leadership pipeline stuff, those who move from an individual contributor to a first time supervisor. And then as you continue to work your way up in an organization, you want to keep improving your skills. So we'll do coaching and courses and that type of thing. So that's on the leader development side. On the onboarding side, that is just moving an individual from outside of a company, inside a company, or into that job. And uh, basically, you're looking at the first year. So from the moment that, in Twitter language, from yes to desk is the pre-boarding process. Hmm. The first two or three weeks uh, in the company, it's really high value time to ensure that they understand culture and they feel fittedness and that type of Hmm. thing. And then over the course of the rest of the year, you're working with folks to help them understand, embrace the culture, and then live out that culture. So if that sounds anything like engaging freshmen during the first 10 days on <laughs> campus, there are there are some commonalities in that. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. So get to do both of those two things together. That's awesome. I know as you're thinking about that, I'm, I'm going to ask a question here in just a minute because I'd like to go back to that. But you're also heavily involved in Resonate Church. What's kind of your role look like there? Yeah. So one of our founding guys here at Resonate headed down to Texas to help plant a church, uh, the Rim, down in the Austin area, mm-hmm. and that left a vacancy. Because I knew uh, Resonate, uh, Keith Weezer and I and the other leaders there, we've been connecting since 2009. So basically have a decade worth of relationships and trips and, and coaching involved with them. They asked, hey, Brian, would you be willing to step into this role here. And Heidi and I prayed about it. I mean, we had moved out from Ohio to Washington to be a part of Resonate, did not know the role, the position. But when Keith made the ask mm-hmm. and said, hey, would you be willing to do this? Uh, yeah, we we prayed it through. We talked through community. We talked with our community about that and felt like, okay, this is this is what we're supposed to do. So working my, my nine to five, and then work in 10 to 20 hours a week, leading the Pullman site staff team yeah. uh, outside of business hours. So a lot of evenings, a lot of lunch mm. times, and then, uh, mm-hmm. and then the weekends. So we've been doing it for two months. So I am yeah. not a pro at this yet. <laughs> very much a novice, very much learning how. 
but yeah. it's uh it's an unpaid leverage leverage our lives for the gospel kind of role man i love that so brian what as i look back on you know your influence on i feel like north america and churches and specifically churches want to leverage for college for college students you know i know you were you were you know at nam making a big impact and then the switch to say hey i'm gonna go work and i'm gonna be in the marketplace but i also want to give myself fully to my church what led to this kind of transition of you wanting to do that what was kind of the conviction behind that yeah i mean i think on one level it's it's part of my wiring i i, I love new things i i love novel things anything that's going to make a big impact i love to study those things so i did my my phd dissertation on the multi-site church movement the history and the development of it was fascinated did a lot of papers on uh, when i was in seminary on Bill Bright and his leadership of Campus Crusade for Christ. So cruise development was very much a novel innovation when it came along. The interest in collegiate church planting in a, in a similar way. So when we began, I, I think there were two things that were going on. One is in collegiate church planting, we were facing the problem of, we know how to lead people to Christ, help them develop and cultivate, become disciples who make disciples uh, during the college years. But once they leave the college setting, there's just, that's a tough transition. Meg Jay's book, The Defining Decade, talks about that that transition, not religious at all, but just acknowledges that it's a paralysis of analysis stage when people are like, hey, what do I do next? So what we realized is there's this stopgap moment that we've got to figure out how to have college students transition from the university setting into what comes next. So into their defining decade. Mm-hmm. And figure out how to get jobs and how to do what they make disciples wherever they land, whether it's in government or education or marketplace, wherever it is. So we were seeing people leave and we were seeing churches planted. But frankly, when you plant churches with college students, at first, it's pretty high cost. And college students and recent graduates really don't have a lot of money right out the gate. So we were thinking, how do we how do we see, how do we capture the momentum of churches that are being planted by college students and yet stabilize that when they move out into their community and, and engage there? So what we realized is, hey, we've got to solve for this generating resources, income, monies from inside, and then being able to cultivate a base, a scaffolding of people to go out and plant. So much of our church planning focus is really aimed at the church planter, his wife, the team that goes around, the startup funds. But we don't, for those who don't feel called to be a church planner or who don't feel called to be on staff, we don't have a lot of systems and processes for them. So I think on an individual level, I want to explore this new area, figure out how to make it go forward. And then at the same time, feeling a calling inside of me, a tension inside of me. I think those are sometimes those can be a simultaneous thing, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that my family was not leveraged towards planting churches in the college context. So our kids are hearing us talk about it, tell these stories of great things happening, but they're not able to see, touch, taste it firsthand. Mm -hmm. So our move out here was in response to what we since got calling us to do. We looked at all kinds of different collegiate church planning hubs to move into, but since God was saying here, so the move here was really generated by somebody's got to figure out how Mm -hmm. to go help plant churches but focus on the marketplace side, the Kobo side, mm. so that we have scripts for people to see. This is what it looks like when somebody's loving Jesus, following Jesus, uh, but not on a staff in a full-time kind of way. So yeah. that's that's really the driver behind it. Man, that's so good. What what are some of the, I know it hadn't been that long for you. You've kind of moved your family out. Y'all got settled down. But in terms of, are there any insights you'd give on that you've learned so far about that piece of being like that marketplace leader that's a part of a plant? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is not going to be fun for any pastoral leader who's listening. To that. <laughs> I don't know what I'm about to say. So I just, uh, you know, buckle up and, and just uh, just take a moment to hear it out. Yeah. Uh, you know, what what happens is we all get theological training. We go to ministry places. We go to spaces. And in general, we're pretty isolated in our thinking. Most of what we think about is from the ministry perspective. Moving into this role now, I, I knew that. I came from that. It was very adept and attuned to what it feels like in denominational and church world life. But to now be in a marketplace role, it's just a very different perspective. I've got to perform at my job. I've got to go to that job five days a week. 
I've got responsibilities that I have to do in order to live, feed my family, I mean, do all those things. Yeah. And then I've got church world in, involved in that. So I think for a long time, I focused so much on what we were trying to get people to do and what we wanted them to do and them growing as disciples and them doing their quiet times and them doing it. And I just had very little perspective, very little appreciation of how little time that folks really have mm. if they're in roles or if they're in jobs that are high demand. Mm -hmm. So the key thing that I would try to embed in everybody's thinking is when you're first thinking about engaging a person in your congregation or you're thinking about your body as it is, I would use a, the five hour rule. I would think in my head, I need to ask no more than five hours of time from all of our people here until they get to a point where they want to own and generate something on their own. Mm -hmm. So I know, I know that may sound a little bit controversial because we follow Jesus with our whole lives as a, a holistic thing. But what happens is oftentimes our programming eclipses that five hour slot. And so they're not walking with Jesus for only five hours. They're doing our program for five hours or yeah. 10 hours or 20 mm -hmm. hours. So the thing that I'd say is for those of you who are planting or you starting out and you're trying to bring people into the orbit of your congregation, think how can we limit the ask, at least initially, when it comes to programming to five hours, because time is just far more limited for husband and wife who are working full-time jobs than I, I think I understood or appreciated. And of course, it's not just about those, those jobs, right? It's about their kids and getting mm -hmm. them to school and making dinner every night and running them all to their sports and activities. Mm -hmm. So I think as, as church leaders, if we would think about limiting our programmatic asks mm -hmm. to whether it's small groups on campus or off campus, or it's in homes or whatever, I'd say that that's a key, key thing. Think five hours first when it comes to programming. Another thing I'd say is, you know, it is, I think it's increasingly, especially during COVID, COVID season, to invite people to come into a congregational setting, to invite people into church. That, that's a, first, it's a larger space. And I, I know we have different views of it from, from where we live, different places. Washington's, I think, a little bit more stringent than most others. But asking people to come into a congregational setting is probably not the best first ask. Yeah. The best first ask is probably into your home. Mm. We've been here you know, a year and a half, and even with COVID, we probably had 150 people through our home that are not connected with with church world so that's an easy ask for people to come over to dinner to ask their stories to share yours so th those would be the mm -hmm. two things limit your programmatic ask for mm -hmm. people in your congregation to five hours a week and then get as many people as you can through your homes or teach those things i think those mm -hmm. are those are big takeaways from from our long history of a year and a half into this <laughs> yeah Man, so what do you on the whole, so you said you had about 150 people come through your house. How has yeah. that, so I feel like in, when it comes to people who are believers, that seems to be pretty normal. Have you found yeah. that to be strange with folks that maybe don't have that kind of, has that been like a weird thing for you? Like, you want me to come to your home to eat? Like, Yeah, no, actually, you know, people, I think people in general are starving for community. They, they want yeah. community. Mm -hmm. Now this, this may be, I think this is a, all, another benefit of being in the space that I'm at. I can invite people. I'm, I'm meeting increasing numbers of people in my workplace, mm -hmm. partially by the nature of my job, and partially by my excitement to network with people and to influence them with the gospel. So mm -hmm. I am meeting people, connecting with people on a regular basis because I'm in that marketplace. It's very normal stuff. When I go to a kid's sporting event or a play or a performance of some kind, I'm meeting parents and interacting with parents in, in that way. So when you're in a ministry slot or you're in a denominational slot, oftentimes you just don't have those relationship chains. Mm -hmm. There's not a reason to connect with people unless you are being intentional about saying this is going to be my mission field of engagement or you're being invited into something. In my slot now, I'm meeting with all kinds of people, people who follow Jesus, people who don't follow Jesus all the time. And to say, hey, man, I know you're new to the community or, hey, I would love for you to meet my family. I'd love to meet your your family. Those normal things We're new into the community now. So I say, hey, we're trying to get to know folks. Would you guys be willing to come over? We'll cook. And I mean, honestly, I think I've had I've had one person one of all the people that I've met, I've had one person say no. 
and there was a reason, some special needs with with family members that wouldn't mm -hmm. permit it at the time, and that would have been pre-COVID. Gotcha. Now, during COVID, we've limited that back a little bit, yeah. but we're chomping at the bit to turn that right back up. Gotcha. Man, that's cool. Well, what did you, what was you, you mentioned earlier about the onboarding with where you're at now versus yeah. like some of the church. Is there any kind of similarities in that of like what you, what you're doing in the, in the work marketplace versus like the church or what maybe, what maybe have you learned in the marketplace that could translate to the church? church yeah. Work? Well, a, a couple of things we have talked about leadership development, competencies, competency development, a lot. I know our friend Mac Lake, uh, guys like Rick Duncan, Charles Campbell, some of those folks in, in the North American Mission Board or, or, Orbit, guys like Luke Francis we were talking about earlier. These folks talk about competencies. I don't think I fully appreciated how valuable that leadership, like a deck, a set of leadership competencies to work from, how valuable it was. So we, at my company, we use a content from Corn Ferry. Uh, you can Google that up and take a look at it. The FYI set. So they have 38 leadership competencies that they use. So we use those and implement those within the company. Um, the carry, like if you get that FYI book, it's a hundred bucks, but all you need to do is take that book and wed it to how Jesus lived his life. Mm -hmm. And you have a disciple making tool and process that is just really remarkable. Mm. So I, I think I have a much deeper appreciation for leadership competencies hmm. that are clearly defined and laid out. You don't have to create those on your own. You can use Corn Ferry, and there are other companies that do it. I just Corn Ferry is the best one that we've seen. It's clear, and tight, and compact. Hmm. Secondarily, or a second thing, is the place where I work. We use feedback regularly. I mean, it is short feedback loops. So you do things well, you get feedback on it. You do things poorly, you get feedback on it. It's very depersonalized. It's not meant to be harmful. It's meant to help our company continuously improve. So we want to see a group of people become the best individuals they can be, whether they're an individual contributor or they're a supervisor. So I have naturally, I think in my personhood, have wanted to give and receive feedback regularly. I always want to know where I stand with folks. I want to tell them what I think about what they're doing. That has been remarkable and I'm using that kind of mindset with our team. It's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing our team has worked, or excuse me, our organization has a set of principles that we go by. So a set of values that we go by. And you know, a lot of companies will have those. A lot of churches will have those. Mm -hmm. And our organizational space, we live those values. Like we talk about them all the time. We cite them in annual review feedback time. As I lead the onboarding team, every team meeting that we do, we spend 10 to 15 minutes working through those principles at the very beginning of our time. So I, again, I've heard about organizations, companies having a set of values and principles that they talk about, but I've never been a part of an organization where we live and abide by that value set. It's not a, not a spiritual organization that we're part of, right? It's, a, it's an engineering company, mm -hmm. but man, living by those principles, it is, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is our set of beliefs and, and we, we abide by them, talk about them, live them out. So those would be the three things. Figure out, go, go look at that F FYI competency stuff. Think about how you incorporate feedback within the, the leaders that you're working on, the people that you're discipling. And then the last piece is generate, utilize a set of principles and talk about it, process it, lay it out. And these, these principles, they're not necessarily scientifically based. I mean, they're from good sources and, and they're good, but they're not like magical formula words. They're not mm -hmm. They're not a crafted extremely tightly. And I mean, they're, they're pretty, man, they're just pretty smart. That's just what they are. They're, they're, <laughs> they're clean and simple and, and smart. So you those said, would be three things. You said F, did you say FYI competencies? Yeah. So uh, if you look at Corn Ferry, K-O-R-N, and then Ferry, F-E-R-R-Y, there's a book called FYI. It's for your improvement. Mm, gotcha. And I, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, like, Every, if you're in leader development, you need to buy this book and you need to put it on your shelf. Mm. And when you're struggling with somebody who, who like they don't build teams well or they mm. don't instill trust, you go to this book and there's mm. about 15 pages of just in time kind of ideas and how to do it. This is just really, really potent. Wow, that's cool. I have to check that out. FYI, Corn Ferry. All right. Yeah. yeah. That's good stuff. Hey, Brian, I want to jump into, you said something a minute ago about the feedback, the quick feedback. 
you know, I know that that's something that, you know, that's something that I struggle with. I think, I think that's something a lot of people struggle with. It's usually if, if someone is not maybe performing well in a ministry, there's always that weird kind of tension of like, how do I approach this is, do I just give grace and just kind of let them, but what have you seen from that quick feedback? How do you do that? And what have you seen as the benefit of just that quick turnaround feedback, feedback loop on stuff? Yeah, I mean, we're we're all evaluating each other's contributions and impacts all the time. And if you say, well, I'm, I'm not really, well, you're taking notes on how people are doing things and functioning. We all observe behaviors or tendencies in other people that are good and they're mm-hmm. bad. When people are doing things that are good, we want to affirm that quickly, let them yeah. hear about it. Mm-hmm. And if they know behaviorally, this is a good pattern, this is a good activity, you affirm it then people tend to do that that more, especially if you're discipling somebody, you have an intern that's working with you. In a similar way, when people are doing behaviors that are bad, if we don't address them in the moment, then they continue on that bad pattern in that mm-hmm. loop. Yeah. And so it's either you pay uh, you pay the relational tax mm-hmm. in a short, smaller way, so you're, you're paying pennies and nickels, or you don't deal with it, you don't talk about it, you wait, you let it aggregate, you let it build together, and then you're paying for it in 50 and hundred dollar bills later on down the road. So yeah. if you want to see people around you get better, become more equipped, become more efficient, become more self-aware, you've got to do short feedback loop with them quickly mm. and around what they're doing in small ways and not let it stack. So mm. the tool that I would encourage everybody to look at, there's an organization called Center for Creative Leadership or CCL. They have a model that they use called the SBI model. So what it does is it teaches you how to very clearly and very concisely bring up feedback with another individual, with somebody you work with. So you give the situation, you give the behavior, and you give the impact. So you think SBI, 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 anytime you get in an emotional state where you're like, oh, I recognize they did something well, I'm going to give them an SBI. So so Mm -hmm. situation, behavior, impact. Oh, they just did this thing. It didn't go well. I'm going to give them a situation behavior impact. So somebody on your team sends an email, the email is grammatically, it's all over the place, not clear. It's like, you give them say, hey, when we're sending out emails, when you send it from our organization, you represent us. So I want to encourage you, make sure you take a little bit of time to proof that email over a little bit more. Or because if you don't, how do people look at our organization? Well, they look at it like we don't care about it. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, somebody sent you an email. It's been two weeks. You haven't responded to them at all. So the situation is, hey, you sent this email, behavior is you didn't respond to it. And now what's the impact? Well, our customer or the person who's working with us, how do you think they're feeling in this moment? What do you, what do you perceive that their view is of our organization when we're not responding them to them in a, an appropriate way? So that SBI process, again, from Center for Creative Leadership is super, super helpful. I'm giving feedback to folks um, on average, probably three or four times a day. And not to one individual, but different folks. But I encourage them also, hey, if you see me doing something that's helpful, let me know. Give me feedback. Hey, if you see something I'm doing that's causing you tension, is making you feel not good about something, let me know. So we're doing that all the time. And now we, at our organization, we have a culture of feedback and, mm. and, and we get it all the time. So let me give you a quick example of using that within Resonate. Yeah. We've got a team that's about to go out and plant. They're going to leave our congregation. The leader of that team, he's in that group. He is in the process of buying a home, and that means that he'll be leaving. When you buy a home and you're in one place, you're moving to another, there's a tendency for you to just go ahead and start checking out. So with yeah. the group, I said, hey, I know that several of you are going to be leaving our staff, and it's going to be coming up soon. So that's the situation. Sometimes when you get ready to leave, you begin to check out mentally. Now you can do that too quickly or you could do that too fast. I want you to pace yourself on that. So behavior, pace yourself on the departure. Don't go hot on us and say, hey, I, I'm going to work, work, work until I leave or don't go cold on us and they jump out. Impact is, hey, if, if you guys don't honor us in a graduated departure, it, it's going to set up a team up for failure. So mm-hmm. it, again, it's using that tool in that way. That was more of a group setting than an individual. Yeah, that's good. Brian, what do you think are some, what are some thoughts, uh, use the term covo, co-vocational, um, some people may, you know, if you don't know what that is, think bivocational, but think of, I don't know exactly how, wasn't it, uh, oh, who's the guy? It's Brad, Brad, Brad Briscoe. Briscoe. Brad Briscoe, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like and his, he has a book called Co-Vocational Church Planting. And then just following Brad on Twitter and, and looking at him, great, great thinking. Yeah, I strongly encourage folks to go, yeah, to go look him up. He's a good follow. But, but now that you're kind of in the middle of that, are there any, maybe, is was there any misconceptions that you thought about, you know, that kind of lifestyle in, in a working marketplace, being fully invested in your church? Is there any misconceptions you had out there that you see that people have? And, and also, is there any opportunities that you see in that that maybe churches aren't, I don't know, kind of leveraging? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm so early into it, right? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm two months into the role, so I think anything that I say would be a little bit premature. I think basic basic observation is as we have as we've come into the role, Keith Evans and I, so he's in a co-pastor role with me. We have been doing one hour interviews, asking a set of five questions to our owners, our members of the church, learning about their story, what they think we're doing well, what they think we're not doing well, what they'd like to do within the congregation. So we're doing all of our members, we're going through that process with. Mm-hmm. But here's here's what I hear more, I think more than anything else with a big takeaway. People in our congregations want to be involved in what we're doing. They don't want to be necessarily told what to do. Like, hey, we are the clergy. You are the laity. We tell, we listen to God and we tell you what to do. That dichotomy doesn't work mm-hmm. great. It's, yeah. it, it just, it gets a little wonky really fast. Mm-hmm. But for us as ministry leaders to say to our congregation, what do you feel like God's leading you to do? Where's God active in your life? How can we equip and mobilize you to do? They, they really need community connectivity, and then they need clarity on how they can be a part of what's taking place and what's going on. So uh, the, the thing that I, I feel like I've understood about Kobo is I'm, I feel like I'm closer to and I can understand our congregation better. Again, I'm only two months in, yeah. uh, but understand their perspectives. And so now I'm asking the question, not how can we make our church this thing that we built bigger, better, and make it for us? I'm really asking the question, how can we make this thing so that we can impact people around us? How do we motivate, set up people for success so they can utilize their gifts to impact the community around them? Yeah, that's good, man. Well, Brian, now that you are um, kind of away from the depth of denominational life and, and being a part of, I mean, so many different ministries across North America and now being just kind of centrally located you, you you're you're in uh pullman spokane washington you're working there you're doing church there any advice or thoughts that you'd like to share on just kind of i mean your scope was so wide to now being you know kind of zoomed in here i don't know any any thoughts or any lasting things that you'd want to share with folks about about any of that i think i would i would speak into my denominational friends who spend a lot of time on the road uh, who travel and invest a, a lot of different places, man, your work is valuable and it is beneficial. Uh, if you are struggling with that idea of, man, I'm working on all this cool stuff, I'm getting to touch everything, and it would feel really limiting to only focus on one place. I had those fears, that anxiety. So I moved from a role where we're doing stuff all over North America, mm-hmm. Canada, and then some places globally. And now I live in a community of about 35,000 folks when the college students are here, about 10, 15 when they're <laughs> yeah. not. And, and I was petrified that I was going to feel like I was lo- like I was just insulated in this one little pocket and that I could not, I would be stuck and couldn't get out. So there's fear, anxiety around that. Yeah. My fear has been completely assuaged. I'm able to interact with and network with people all across our organization um, and then in our community as well. So those that, that wanderlust, maybe, I don't know if that's the best term, but that desire to be a global impactor, I am. I mean, we're in a college town, so people that you work with, they impact the world. And then in a company that is, I mean, we're a global company, so I get to work with people all over the world. So if, if you're struggling with that and you're like, ah, I don't know if I want to put all my eggs in one basket or focus mm-hmm. on one place, you know, just think about Jesus's ministry. He really just invested in a dozen or so guys in a pretty small area. And I know it was a long time ago and it was a different set of circumstances, <laughs> but he did just focus on a few and man, his impact has been radical. So I, I would encourage you if, if you're struggling with feeling like your impacts all over the place and you're not, you're just scared to go into that one location it, it, it ain't that bad. In fact, it, it's pretty stinking good. Yeah, man, that's good, man. 
Brian, any other thoughts you have on just, you know, so ingrained in, again, North America collegiate kind of movement where it's going, any thoughts on its future or where, where people need to place maybe emphasis or focus, anything like that you'd add? Yeah, I mean, anybody listening in to, to round up podcast world, they, they're already leveraged towards college students. Mm-hmm. I continue to believe that the, the college campus is the most strategic mission field in the world, yeah. that freshmen, win freshman today, you win the world tomorrow, that the first 10 days are the most important of a person's life on a lot of different levels, but it's still only the top one to 2% globally that ever make it onto a college campus. So I, I would say, hey, let's double down in mm-hmm. the university environment. And even further than that, I'd say that everything in the community is on a lag from what's happening real time on the college campus. So you're dealing downstream when we're working on what's taking place in most of our community churches. If you want to move into the tip of the spear and you want to figure out, hey, how are we going to be able to do ministry 10 to 20 years down the road? Mm -hmm. It really it's like a double down or triple down or quad down into Mm -hmm. the campus. So it is only going to become more strategic and it is only only going to become more consequential as we move forward into the future. So if you've been having doubts on, hey, whether we engage campus, don't just do it. Mm-hmm. If you're like, hey, those college students, they cost a lot of time and energy and resources, but man, they don't they don't yield much. Well, that's right now because the future of your church is being built on that college campus. And if, if you don't engage it, you're going to miss out on a, on a great experience. Man, man, that's a good word. Well, Brian, thanks so much for, for jumping on with us, kind of giving us an update on where you're at, what you're doing, and obviously can still tell you have a great love for, for college students, obviously invested in Resonate Church, but also in the marketplace. And, and we'd love to have you on again. I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation to hear how helping people in the marketplace, man, just be unleashed in God's mission and how to help church leaders kind of navigate that and get themselves out of their own little bubble. Because I I know I've been there. I know I am there. I, I, I live in a, I've got a Christian wife and I go to a Christian church. I live in a Christian or I work in a Christian institution and, you know, we can kind of insulate ourselves there. And, and so yeah. excited to see what you're going to uncover and would love to just continue to learn from you, man. Thanks so much, man. If, uh, if the listeners will pray for us and, and what we're doing and, and just that, please, please just pray for wisdom that we'll, mm. we'll make, we'll make good decisions. We, uh, yeah, we, f- we feel the weight of, of wanting to do everything well mm-hmm. and uh, want to honor our king. Yeah, that's good. Well, we will. We'll be praying for you, Brian, and man, just appreciate your time and joining us, man. Thanks so much. Well, friends, thanks for joining the conversation I have with Brian Fry. Sorry even about some of those audio issues. We had a little technical difficulty, so we had to record it on Zoom. So my apologies for that. But thanks for sticking around. Uh, It's a joy to talk to Brian. I thought he gave us some great tips and thoughts on college ministry, but how to develop teams. And then, and even some of that, hey, what do we do with the folks that that maybe aren't quote-unquote called to ministry? How do we help develop them? in our local churches. So really good stuff. Well, well, y'all don't forget Roundup May 12th through the 14th. It's going to be in DFW. Don't forget to register at sbtexas.com forward slash Roundup and get involved in our Facebook group, the Roundup Network. We have tons of leaders in there that idea share, collaborate, share resources, ton of fun. Follow us on social media at SBTC Collegiate on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast. Leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Well, friends, thanks for sticking around, and we will see you next time.